Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Hank Philippi Ryan. Hank is the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV. She's won 37 Emmys and dozens more honors for her groundbreaking journalism. The nationally best-selling author of 14 thrillers, Ryan's also an award winner in her second profession with five Agathas, five Anthonys, two McCavities, the Daphne, and for the other woman, the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. Wow. I mean, I don't know if someone's done the math on that, but it's like 100 million. 100 million awards for Hank. Critics call Hank a master of suspense and a superb and gifted storyteller. And she is the only author to have won the Agatha in four different categories. Best first novel, best novel, best short story, and best nonfiction. Holy cow. Welcome, Hank. That's that's great, Danielle. I love that. 100 million. It's got to be true. I, mean, I think I did the math pretty well. It's dang close to 100 million. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm Hank is not only a really good friend, but I am a, a huge fan of Hank's writing and her stories and have been since um, the beginning. So I'm so thrilled to have you here today joining us to talk about, I think, what may maybe my favorite Hank Philby Ryan book, The House Guest. So please tell our listeners and viewers about The House Guest. Oh my golly, thank you. Just everything you said, just back at you, back at you. It's just um, (laughs) this crazy world of authors and author pals is really so endlessly wonderful. And the idea that we can know each other and know about each other's lives and chat with each other like this, I mean, it's 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 terrific. And I'm a huge, huge fan of yours. So so uh, I can't wait to talk to you about your books, but let me show you, Danielle. Yes. Look, Ah, this is very gorgeous out of the very first box. I mean, look started. how beautiful. And you're, I noticed her perfect life is behind you on the door. That's yes. a, your covers are always so fantastic. Well, we should talk about this before I tell you about the book. I mean, I agree with you about the covers. And what I said to Forge, my darling publisher, I said, I want her to look enigmatic, like she has a secret. Like we're not quite sure whether she's good or bad. Could go right. either way she certainly has some sort of agenda you know there yes. she's just coming over to have a glass of wine and sit in the sun mm-hmm. this woman has something on her mind so mm-hmm. the house guest the house guest stars Alyssa McCallan and we love Alyssa McCallan but she's very very sad Alyssa has just been dumped by her rich and powerful and quite manipulative husband with without a word without a warning she's been a great wife for eight years she can't figure out why he's gone she's done absolutely nothing and very happy so bill has threatened to take the house and the money and the paintings and the cape cod house and all has already taken all the friends so Alyssa thinks you know when in a nasty divorce in a surprising divorce one spouse gets all the friends and what does the other one get if they're lucky they get the benefits so Alyssa just when the time is right meets a new friend a seductive kind of new ally surprising one who has some problems of her own and these two women decide that maybe they can solve each other's problems and when the fbi comes knocking at the door that's when the action really takes off and it's interesting because it's um been compared to gaslight meets thelma and louise by way of strangers on a train and you right can, yes you can sort of get that from it you know yeah. gaslight the little manipulation thelma and louise two powerful strong female characters and strangers on a train you know what that is but yes maybe the book isn't that that's the kind of gaslighting part as well so it's two smart women 
facing off in a high stakes psychological cat and mouse game to prove their truth about a devastating financial crime. But which woman is the cat and which woman is the mouse? And that is that is the house guest. That is the house guest. That is the you're on the you're on the edge of your seat now. Like, oh, my God, I got to get my hands on this book. So. Um, can you tell, is there a specific, I love, always want to hear about like where, how the story came, like, was there a specific inspiration for the story or a seed, you know, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I love that question. I know you, I know, you know, well, that a lot of authors hate it because they're like, I don't know where it came from. I'm just, I'm just lucky. I don't know. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about a couple of places that this idea came from. And, you know, when you have a good idea, and I know you know this, Danielle, when you have a good idea, it's like when you drop a pebble into a pond and the ripples just start going out. And when you have a good idea, you know, that pebble idea, you can feel the ripples and you can say to yourself, oh, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen in this book, but that could be a good story. That could be a good story. So one, one of the puzzle piece pebbles to mix metaphors, one of the, one of the, one of the pebbles um, was the pandemic. And I know this sounds so crazy, but my husband is a criminal defense attorney um, and I'm a writer and a reporter. So every day for the past 27, or however many more, however many years we've been married before the pandemic, he'd go off to his law office every morning and I'd go off to Channel 7 to do my job as a reporter and we didn't see each other all day. So that's that's typical. When the pandemic started, Jonathan took over the breakfast room as his law office and that's where he does all of his work, which is just down the hall. And I'm here in my study, just down the hall from him. And I realized that we were both working all day, but I had no idea what he was doing. He could have been doing anything in the kitchen. I mean, like he's in the kitchen and I'm here. He could be doing anything. I mean, I understand about lawyering and we talk about his cases in a general kind of way. Um, and he's a wonderful, marvelous person, but what was he doing in there? I have That's no your crime right? Yeah, that's your crime writer brain. It's not that Jonathan was doing anything wrong. It's that, ooh, oh, there's totally a husband so. in the other room and that and right and an unsuspecting wife married so long like you just start to take for granted that they're doing yes. their job but and they you say how was your day honey and he, he says fine and also danielle and also i'm in here in this in this in my little study writing my book i could be doing anything i could be writing all work and no play makes hank a devil girl over and over and over and over like in shining he wouldn't know i could be writing anything so i started thinking how well do we really know our loved ones, our spouses, our significant others, the people that we consider friends? How well do we really know who's sleeping next to us? You know, if could they be keeping, could they be keeping a secret? So there's right. that very powerfully, very powerfully driven home to me. And then I remembered that a million years ago in a complete other part of my life, I had a friend. She was a great woman. She was happily married. And every day she would get up and go to work and send her husband off to whatever job he had, which was, he was like a, you know, an accountant or a insurance person, something they had to do money and sales. Yes. Money and, sales. Yes. and every night she'd come home and he'd say, to, and he'd, she'd say, how did it go? And he'd say, you know, the next big deal is right around the corner. The next big sale is right around the corner. And she was very supportive. And she's, as I keep saying, she's a very smart woman until one day the police came to their door. And it turned out that he had never gone to work, that he never had a job, that this was all completely a fantasy and that he had been home on the computer doing things that I don't even want to go into, but were just extraordinarily disgustingly illegal. And she had no idea. She just didn't know. And, you know, at first I thought, come on, you know, you're not paying attention. How could you not know? But the pandemic taught me that you could that you could not know. Of course, yeah. And how then? And we're still and we're still talking about the house guest. I'm going to show you this cover again. Beautiful. Um, how then does a person come back from that? Um, how do you regain your power? How do you get your own life back? How do you um, shed that? pity of other people or yeah. by association of other people how do you get yourself back and that's it's a thriller it's a murder mystery that's what the house guest is a psychological thriller but that was what the themes are how well right. do we do who we think we love 
And how do we get our lives back after a devastating discovery like that? God, and it's and actually, I think it's so relevant because we've all heard, especially if you think about like before you you could be phone, tracked by your phone and all you know. Like nowadays, if you if you were a suspicious, or, you know, you could always be like, "Well, there he is. My husband's at work. I can see that that's where his phone is." But before that, we really, I mean, we really didn't have a way to track people. And if you're in a relationship with another, you know, a, adult, a trust, what you think is a trustworthy adult, and you don't have evidence and of course we want to believe that our spouses are trustworthy so we don't you know we don't search for evidence that they're not um i i can actually i mean and i can imagine how that poor woman too because how frustrating is it and just like for Alyssa, how frustrating is it for her to think that she to, to realize that she didn't even know what was you know what her husband was thinking and that is it's she's going to get pity she's going to feel stupid and oh it's on top of the heartache there's that whole thing and i it sets her up in a beautiful way at the beginning of this, I mean, for this book, which is amazing. And so it, your books always feature, I think, I mean, in, in my head, women that are grappling with power, right? Whether yes. it be jobs, money, relationships, and often against sort of a stronger and better equipped opponents. So what about that interests you? I mean, I, I can imagine a million reasons, but what do you, what do you think about that? It's such a, I, I love that observation. Wow, that, and you're exactly right. My books are about power. My books are about people who want something. And the question is, how far will they go to get it? And I think a lot of women um, are sort of brought up, at the, in my day, they were brought up to make everybody be happy, to make everything work, to make everybody happy, to make the family work, to make their business work, to make their jobs work. You know, they were going to be the ones to be the facilitators and the producers and the organizers and the ones, you know, that people say, I just don't know how you do that all. You know, it's just know. so great, right? And sometimes there are people whose whose desires and whose power wants something else and they will use you and they will step on you and they will manipulate you and they will gaslight you to get you to do what they want. And you and sometimes you just don't know it. I mean, because when a when a person is an optimist and a good person and just being um, trying to make everything in everyone's life be fabulous, you know, you might not notice that. You just might not notice that someone doesn't have your benefit. Um, at heart. And I think that all of us, um, especially these days, are struggling to say, wait a minute, I'm important. I count. I have I have goals. I have my own needs and desires. I have my own um, hopes for success and happiness. And wait a minute, get out of my way. You know, it's my turn. So it's a juggle. It, it's really a juggle and it's a balance. And that power how people, you know, my books are not violent. There's no graphic sex. There's no graphic violence. There's not even inappropriate language. Um, but there, but there's gaslighting and there's manipulation and there's the evil that we do to each other psychologically. That sometimes um, manipulation and gaslighting that we do to each other's minds is just as devastating sometimes as the destruction of a gun or a knife. It can oh. move that destabilization, right. that disequilibrium. And that's what it, that's what begins the house guest. And that's what begins all my books as well, is this sort of disequilibrium, someone who thinks everything is fine. Mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, with a knock on the door or a meeting someone else, it's just not fine. And, that, and that's what I have to explore as well. And I think the thing that's so lovely actually is I think, of course, you know, a lot of a lot of books that we read and I love and including my own are more, you know, they they do have the graphic sort of violence in them. But there is, is something almost more evil in some ways about these manipulators, because it, it's easy to see um, when you're a knife is unsheathed that so, that you know someone is threatening you but to see it when it's you know when it's done in manipulation by somebody you know sort of sucking up to you or or pretending to get like offering to give you what you want in a way that then twists back to their benefit it's it's you know it's a it's a it's a darker kind of more twisted type of situation right and happens to us all the time 
especially oh, women. And, and especially, well, I think especially women. I think especially yeah. women, which is sort of crazy to say. But I mean, I think one of the ways that psychological manipulation is so successful is when someone pretends to be doing it for your own good. Mm -hmm. Sort of, um, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Um, listen, I, it's not exactly how let me just give you an idea and I'm sure you're fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. But mm -hmm. just let me say to you, what if this, you know, have you ever thought about maybe he's not being that nice to you? Have you ever thought about maybe, right. you know, and you, and it just plants that little seed of doubt right? And you begin to see your world in a different way, the way this person wants you to see it. And I'm not going to name any names of no, who's doing I know. it in, in the house <laughs> because Pretty much everybody is doing it to everybody because everybody wants something and everybody um, will do almost anything to get it. And I, and I think that's such a, that's such a pivotal thing. And it's so, it too, is. Female friendship. I love to explore female friendship mm -hmm. because to a woman who meets another woman who's, I mean, Alyssa at the beginning of the book, let me say, meet someone who, whose life seems to be even in more upheaval than her own. Right. And Alyssa is basically such a good person. She realizes, you know, what are the troubles of one little person like me? You know, I'm, right. I'm well off. I'm happy. I'm just a little bit sad. You know, get over it, sister. I'm going right. to help someone else. And that's how the books begin, book begins with Alyssa helping someone else. And that's right. her goal. Which is also, I think, a very female thing because you know you take it back to sort of the caretaking and the and the the the, the woman's job is smoothing everything over, making sure everybody's fine. Oftentimes, I think traditionally in, you know, in, in front of us, like, you know, you're, you're responsible. I mean, your children and your families and your you know neighbors and everybody sort of comes first. It's like, once everybody's happy, then I can worry about me. And yet, of course, we know how, how that turns out. And then women, because we are all in that position, sometimes are like the worst to each other, right? Because it's like, well, here's somebody finally, maybe I don't have to take care of, maybe that person can can take care of me and I can just leverage a little something. So there's this, there's a sort of, you know, um, I don't know what to even say, a little bitchy balance here sometimes between oh, no, definitely so, women. Definitely so, definitely so. But we're inclined, I, this is just so, is such a generalization. We're, we're inclined to be, to think of the best of someone. We're inclined yeah. to think, oh, thing, you know, let me help you. You right. know, I, oh, I've been there before. Oh, I, I feel I, I'm, I'm so sympathetic because I, I completely understand where you are. And, exactly. and we all, and, I, and you're such a good point because we all have felt heartbroken and yeah. vulnerable, yeah. needy. And when if just the right person comes at just the right time, um, we may be super vulnerable to that. You know, I was doing some research about... Um, what how, women who don't know what their spouses were doing and how wow. often happens. and right. wow danielle it's crazy scary the btk killer right a wife and three kids no idea that he was stalking people and torturing them no idea the right. woman who dated and then married ted bundy you know who yeah. said he seems like such a nice guy you know Ooh. that this, i read about this case um in the midwest where a woman thought her husband was maybe acting a little bit strange, but you know, he was a quirky guy anyway. Uh, and one day, one of their children came home from being out in the woods in their backyard and brought home a, a skull. And so that was buried in the woods in their backyard. And so the wife, of course, takes it to the husband and says, you know, look what Jimmy found in the backyard. And the husband says, oh, yes, um, that's my father's old medical skeleton from medical school. And the woman says, oh, okay. I'm not like, why would you bury your father? Right. And so one, finally one day, she got a little bit uh, suspicious because he was kind of being gone at strange times. She called the police about the skull. They went out into the, to the, they went out into the backwoods and there were at least 11 people that he had killed. The bought thousands of bones, this article said. And she, God! Oh, and she just didn't know. She just didn't know i mean it, it's and then on the on the white collar side i'm just going to babble on the white collar no, side it's good. think about bernie madoff oh right his wife and uh i read a story where about um i guess it was nicole kidman who was it nicole kidman who played june madoff in is her name june or ruth 
One of Mrs. I can't, Madoff. I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, whoever Mrs. Madoff was, I can't remember her name. And and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer said that she met absolutely no one who thought that Mrs. Madoff knew anything about right. what her husband was doing. That um, she has always insisted she didn't know. Right. People and colleagues insist, no, you know, she just didn't know. And we think, oh, please, you have to know. But maybe she mm -mm. didn't. Maybe she didn't. So does Alyssa know what her husband may or may not be doing? Does she or doesn't she? Mm -hmm. It's such a good, I mean, it's such a, it's just such a great setup because of course, especially like, as you say, in like the Madoff case, we, you know, we, so many people lost so much money that were like, what was her, what was wrong with her that she didn't see it? Or like the BTK, BTK killer, like your, your husband is a serial killer and you don't know it. But I, I think there's an argument on both sides, a hundred percent. So it's really, it's a, such a fascinating, I mean, it's such a fascinating setup and, and it's, it's very believable. I mean, we hear these things and they always sort of strike us as being unbelievable, but they happen all the time. So clearly it's not unusual, right? Well, it's not unusual. It's a little unusual. I mean, the extremes or, <laughs> yeah, maybe the serial killer and the made off it, but in little ways, I think that, that uh, the discussion or the question of how well, you know, the person that you share your life with is very valid. I mean, there are things we just probably don't know, which is a little bit scary, right? Yeah, it's a little bit scary, but it certainly is a fodder for a good Great fodder. fodder. This totally. article about an organization called the White Collar Project. And it's about, it's an organization of women whose spouses have committed white collar crimes and who have been arrested for white collar crimes. And the woman who runs it is this marvelous woman. And she says, you know, by far, most women have no idea what their husbands are doing until the feds come to the door. They just, they just don't know. So when we talk about all the seeds for, you know, your books, your, I mean, you also have this incredibly successful career as a, you know, I mean, very high, you know, very highly regarded journalist, all the awards, all that. And I, I always wonder, because of course, you know, that these, none of these people are reporters in this book, but you, you know, do you find that there, your own experiences in that world kind of feed into your stories? How, I mean, how do you leverage your own experiences probably as, you know, not only just as an incredible journalist, but as a woman journalist and the challenges of that, um, you know, how, where does that show up? Because I know it must, right? Uh, well, that is such a long story. We should talk about it and all that, all that leading up to it another time because it is pretty valuable. But, you know, a couple of quick things. I, I've been a television reporter for 43 years, which is crazy. I've wired myself with hidden cameras. I've confronted corrupt politicians. I've gone undercover and in disguise and chased down criminals. You know, I've been at SWAT team things and fires and murders and political conventions and tornadoes and hurricanes and, you know, uh, interviewed murderers and have pe had people confess to murder and have people who are convicted of murder insist they didn't do it. And so it would be silly to have not to mention exactly as you say sort of battling as a woman i started in i started in radio in 1970 uh when there were no women in in, in broadcasting and i got my job because i was a woman there's no there's no question about that jane Pauley, barbara walters uh, jessica savage leslie stahl we all got our jobs because we were women back in the 70s when the equal opportunity laws were uh, new I mean, I walked into the radio station and said, I think you should, I, I'm here to apply for a job as a reporter. And the news director said, that's great. You know, where has been your, your have you had any experience as a reporter? And I, we went through this whole job interview where I had no experience at all. And finally, at the end of this interview where he, it was, he, his eyes were just getting bigger and bigger because I was so completely unqualified. <laughs> he goes, um, you know, you have no experience at all as, as a reporter. I mean, I was 20. You have no experience at all as a reporter. He said, can you give me one reason why I should hire you? And I said, yes, I can. I said, because your license is up for renewal at the Federal Communications Commission right now, and you don't have any women working here. And then I, and then I just smiled. And the next day I had my first job in broadcasting. So Jane Pauley calls us the class of 1970. The I women love it. 
that the women who started in broadcasting in the, in the early 70s, because of the equal opportunity laws, and we knew enough to say, you know what, you're going to get in trouble if you don't hire me. But I love it. I love it. Well, way to turn the power back. Yes. You know? I well, mean, yeah, exactly. Thank you. That was very, and also I was gonna say forty three years in broadcasting. I'm I'm just the math says you were like five when you started. Uh, so that's uh that's uh the other thing. So and then oh, you know you mentioned a lot about you know so your research and your and you know this because you are you know your background is is journalism. You know how do you how do you get yourself to do you know enough research and not sort of get lost in all the other stories because you must have such an you know ability to research so much passion for research you know do you how do you go about looking at a new story you know i am the luckiest person in the world because as a television reporter i was a general assignment reporter for years and then an investigative reporter for many years and as a gen as a as a reporter you know that your goal is to get a good story. You you know that your goal is to have someone say at the end of the day, wow, that was a good story. I could not stop watching. So think about it as for writing a novel. That's exactly what we're going for too. Wow, that's a good story. I could not put it down. So as a reporter, after all these years of, for a long time, writing a story every day, you begin to organize in your brain what a good story needs and what it doesn't. No one knows what you leave out. Some of the things that we have in our brains in, as a result of research, we need we needed to know them, but we don't need to say them. So a good okay. story in, in television and a good story in, in, in fiction has, has a beginning, middle, and an end. It has a character who you care about, an important problem that needs to be solved, there's going to be some clues and research and document searches along the way. In the end, the good guys win and the bad guys get what's coming to them yeah. and you get some justice and you change the world a little bit. So in fiction and investigative reporting, it's exactly the same. So, so interesting. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So if you think about it that way, when from the time we were little and someone put us on their laps, if we were lucky and said, once upon a time mm -hmm. and you think oh and the walls melt away and you know what's going to come here comes a story that's what i that's what i try to that's what i try to do i want you to miss your stop on the subway because right. you can't put the book down and any and i don't want you to turn the channel when you're watching my stories on tv and i don't want you to be able to put the book down when you're reading my stuff stories uh, my books so it's the same momentum, forward motion, narrative thrust, whatever you want to call it. I'm advancing the story all the time. And anything that doesn't advance the story doesn't go in. Absolutely. That's very <laughs> fair, right? So like I you can... said, there's a whole bunch you know. There's a whole bunch of things you know about. In fact, you probably know a lot more about you know the white collar crime stuff than, than shows up in the book, but you know it so that you know which pieces and advance the plot which pieces you can twist because you're also famous for your your twists um so that makes you know that makes that makes so much sense now but let me I tell mean, you it, i'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you but all that stuff that we were talking about earlier about white collar crime and btk yeah. made off none of that is in the book not one not one sentence right. not one sentence of that's not what it's about no no but you know it because it helps you inform the characters right that these are real people who have been you know, potentially tricked by the people that they were closest to, which How is people think, what do they want? What would they do? What would they say? What would be their vulnerabilities and emotions and needs? That's what I take from the research. Yeah, that's so smart. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And I you can see it in your characters. I think your characters, you know, are wonderfully well drawn, motivated. Um, they're, you know, we, we, when they make decisions that we're like, oh no, don't do that. Don't do that. It's because that was the decision they had to make from this, the place where they stood. And it's, um, and then sometimes we're like, oh no, that was the right thing to do, which is, I think, again, sort of the, the way that you do the, the clever twists and turns. So with that said, I have to ask, like, you know, your stories are, there's a lot going on. There's a lot, you're, you know, they're not, this is not like a, um, thin, left right left right end so do you plot your stories hank or um how, you know what's your process for a new book oh my golly so there are days <laughs> i just long for an outline because i have never made an outline in my life 
I have no idea what's going to happen in the end. No idea. I don't know who's good or bad. I don't know who the bad guy is. I don't know who's good. I don't know what their motivations are. I, I just don't know. And the only thing that gets wow. me, the only thing, the thing that gets me to the computer every day actually is thinking, oh, I can't wait to find out what's going to happen. And the only way I can find out what happens is if I sit down and write it. I mean, I know my subconscious is working on it all the time. And sometimes I'll have a little moment when I'm writing when I'll think, oh, then this, then this, then this, then this. But it really never goes farther than like four things. Yeah. That happen happen next so you know every twist every different thing every unexpected thing in my book i i'm is unexpected to me too and that's you know sue grafton used to call that the magic that there's yes. no you know this there's something that happens in the writer brain that if the characters are properly motivated realistically logically motivated then their stories will unfold and it almost brings you with them. I mean, I, I was at an amazing interview between Stephen King and Lee Child, if you can imagine, yes. uh, Paragons. And they both, they each said separately that there were times when they were having a good writing day that they felt that the character was just coming through them, that they were just almost transcribing. And you know those days, I've known yeah. you. You can't make them happen. No. You just have to sit at your desk and do it and see how the story unfolds. Now you asked me this great question about television earlier. Oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, ask me no, this great have, you, you go girl. We're fine. Um, great. Ask me a great question about um, storytelling earlier and about, and about television. And I don't know the end of my novels, but think about, I also don't know the end of my investigative stories, my news stories, because if I did, if I knew the ending, they wouldn't be new. It would be somebody else. Would would have not. Out. Yeah. Right. I go out as an investigative reporter. I go out in search of the story, in search of the story. And that's the same thing I'm doing, just sitting here at this desk. I'm writing in search of the story. Mm -hmm. So I think those years of uh, writing without knowing the ending in, in real life makes it be less scary, not totally less scary, but somewhat less scary to sort of write without a net, trying to walk this story tightrope with the idea that I know that I've typed chapter one and that I have 385 pages to go and I don't have any idea what's going to be on those pages. Why would we do that? You know, I know it sounds like torture, <laughs> but I think it's interesting. I think you, the, the, the fact that you don't know that you are so comfortable with the not knowing the end of a story makes a lot of sense based on your experience, you know, the year, you know, decades of experience in your job. I think for like, I'm not an outliner too. And boy, I feel the same way. Like, wouldn't it be nice just to have some lot, like even just a line about what is, you know, each thing that happens next, but the not knowing the ending and not knowing who, um, who is the bad guy? Who's the good guy that I find so interesting, Hank, but I guess it's true. Absolutely. Investigative reporting, right? We don't oftentimes stories turn themselves on their heads and who we think is a good guy is a bad guy and vice versa. And so. isn't that, I mean, that's a trap too, to decide too soon who's good or bad, because it makes you see the rest of the story through that filter. And you don't want, you don't want a filter. You want reality. And you know, you want an open mind. You want anything is possible because in real life, anything is possible. So in a book, anything is possible. The, the characters just may be keeping secrets from us. Yeah. And so it's up to us to find them out. That is so interesting. So now, I mean, with this, you know, with all the, you know, your, your job and the writing, I mean, you write a book a year, how do you structure your life to get everything done, Hank? I mean, we talked about women. I love the reference to the, you know, you, how do you, everyone's always, that's the best compliment a woman can get. How do you, how do you manage it all? It's that like enjanté ad, you know, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan. Do you remember that from the seventies? Um, so how do you manage it all? Uh, you know, that's interesting because I would say, oh, I don't, it's a mess. It's a disaster. You know, I'm just putting duct tape all over everything all the time. Um, I love it. For, I love it first. I love it. I'm enthusiastic about it. I embrace it. The craziness. I mean, I can't tell you how many days I go, I'll go out into my husband's office and say, this is not going to work. None of this is going to work. This yeah. is not, this is not sustainable. This is not sustainable. And he says, you always say that, you know, I, I know. And um, I had lists and lists 
I have lists with priorities that are essentially numbered. There's nothing better than crossing something off the list. Sometimes I even put things on the list that I've already done so I can cross. <laughs> have Me too. Love that. <laughs> so that sense of accomplishment. Um, when you are doing something that you love, I think it makes it easier. I don't, I don't find the time for things. I make the time for things. I'm, I'm going to do I mean, like my linen closet is probably not perfect looking, you know, but who's going to really see that unless a house guest comes over, that's a problem. Um, so I do it out of love. I do it out of joy. I do it out of deadline. Sometimes I even, frankly, I sometimes do it out of fear. You know, if I don't do this, then fill in the blank X, Y, and Z horrible thing, you know, it could be, but I, I, I have a, gosh, I have an optimism about the world. Um, it, I hope it's not misguided, but that basically I'm lucky and happy. I, I, I enjoy what I do. Um, I, everything I do is kind of fun, even if it isn't because I'm just so lucky and I'm, I'm aware of that every day and grateful for that every day. So yeah, I work really hard. I work, I mean, frankly, I work all the time. I mean, yeah. all the time. nights and weekends, we haven't taken a vacation. We didn't before the pandemic. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, but this is, this is my joy is working. Yeah. And my husband has his, the same passion for his um, criminal defense and civil rights work. He feels the same way. So we're a good team. Yes. And right now we're, you know, very lucky. Yeah, that and that the grat that sort of gratitude is that is a superpower. If you can be really grateful about your life, you can kind of make more things happen. I think, and I, um, and you can't really make more time in a day, but you can certainly squeeze the you know the juice out of every moment. And you know, to be honest, I don't really care about your linen closet as long as you're writing a book a year, Hank. That's that's my priority. So, um, so I would say, you know, what if you were going to sort of give advice to, you know, aspiring authors who do work full time, I mean, you've obviously always done it. I certainly wrote full and worked full time for the first decade of my uh, writing career. What, what advice would you give um, those women or those people, those writers? And those writers. Um, it, it, it's a, it, it's a lot more difficult than you think it will be. The, the metabolism of publishing, of the publishing world is very, can, can be very slow. There's almost no instant gratification about it, except maybe, you know, for yourself, if you're having a good writing day. But people think, oh, I'm going to write a book. So how many times have people said to you, oh, I'm going to do that someday when I have time, or maybe this weekend, you know, I, I think, <laughs> you know, right. good luck, sister, because that's not going to happen. Right. Um, so it's, it's in, a, in the most wonderful way I can ever describe to you, it is very, very difficult. It is the most challenging thing you can ever do. But it's a doable thing. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's an attainable goal. Yes. It just takes sort of word by word by word by word, creating the very best story that you can every time. I would say to be persistent, to be almost obsessed, to be determined, to be open-minded. You know, someone else might have a good idea not to be envious of other people. Don't compare yourself to other people because you'll just spiral down into yeah, doing it. Yeah, right, yeah. I'll do it and it's such a mistake. Um, yeah. to, you know, be optimistic about the possibility that you can do this. My husband and I don't celebrate the anniversary of the day we met. We celebrate the anniversary of the day before we met. And we call that you never know day. We call that you never know day because you never know what wonderful thing is around the next corner. You one day I, I do, and the I next. I love day. that. So I I have to do some math. I have to find the the what if day for us. I think you know somewhere in 1992. But that is so. That's a great. That's a lovely idea. I love that idea. Um, so, and I think the thing. Sorry, the thing you talk about with the writer with an aspiring author too is that. It really is the joy of those days because there's a lot of really hard days and a lot of days when you're like, I can't do this or you feel like you can't do it. But there are, the joy of those days where it works, where you feel that thing, that magic, I think that's the thing you have to, that's the goal because who knows what's going to happen, you know, right? With publication, with success, with all of the rest. 
the only thing the only thing that we can control is writing the best book we possibly can the rest of publishing world is utter craziness and unpredictability and things that we couldn't even possibly have imagined might happen and also that sometimes when something happens that we really wanted that we that and we and we don't get it if so, if we don't get something that we really wanted sometimes when we don't get something that we really wanted and we think oh we're doomed we'll never be happy again i i've i failed sometimes that failure is the best thing that ever could have happened to you because something will happen as a result of that that wouldn't have happened with it so don't so even true. We don't know what's good or bad i hope I, I hope that was even in english we don't even know what's <laughs> good or bad when it happens right just the next thing that happens and we just keep focused you know on our book and our lives as writers mm -hmm. and seeing what happens next and being optimistic about it I think that's such good advice I do I think that's incredible advice so um I want to ask now even though isn't it the worst question ever to have somebody ask you as on the cusp of when your book is coming out what are you working on now you're like ugh. Can I just appreciate this moment? But, but we just, do want to know. We want to know, Hank, what is next? Oh, thank you. Well, it is funny because you know, as a writer brains are so fried at every moment because her perfect life is this this way. Her perfect life um, is out now and the house guest comes out soon. And I'm happy about that. And that's all in my head. But I did just breaking news, send in the first draft to my editor, the final first draft of my next book, which is called One Wrong Word. Um, and I even sent it in on time, totally on time with an ending. Sometimes I, sometimes I'll tell you, I send my books in with no ending. And I think, well, by the time my editor reads the beginning, I'll have the ending done. <laughs> I love that. I love it. It's coming. The ending's coming. Um, coming. well, congratulations. And I love that. I love the title. And, well, um, so that's, you're on a year. So this, you're next, we're talking about, you know, February of 2024. I can't even think of that as a date. Does that Isn't seem that like crazy? Really far away. That's so February crazy. February seventh. February seventh for the precious. The house. Uh, yes, and that is actually this will go live just a few couple days before that. So when you're hearing this, it is time. If you do not already have your copy of the house guest, it is time to get on it because it is coming uh, to your. You know, it can be delivered to your house that day, or you can go pick it up at your bookstore. So that's super exciting. And um, before I let you go, Hank, I want you to touch upon this wonderful thing that you and Hannah Mary McKinnon do because I think it's such a fun thing if people don't know about it. And I've, I've been honored to be on there before, and I think um, sort of started with the pandemic. So just can you share a little bit about First Chapter Fun? Sure. First Chapter Fun, The Joy of My Life, was started by the fabulous Hannah Mary McKinnon, who is a best-selling author in Canada at the beginning of the pandemic. And just sort of as a lark, she read the first chapter of her pal's books, um, one a day, once a day, once every day on Facebook and Instagram. So after, after she did 53 episodes of that, she was getting ready to, including my books, uh, The Murder List, I think she read. Yeah. And uh, she was going to close it and not do it anymore. I said, come on, sweetheart, this is great. You can't not do this. Let's do it together. So long story short, we, de we decided to do it twice a week. And for the past two and a half years, we've done it twice a week, read the first chapter of a fabulous new book out loud on Instagram and Facebook. So you can watch it now on Tuesdays, every single Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. ET on Instagram and Facebook. Hannah Mary McKinnon or I read the first chapter of a wonderful new book out loud, tell you about the author, tell you about the novel. And then you have this gorgeous taste um, of the first chapter of so many new books. What, by the time this is live, we'll be on episode maybe 325. So crazy. And you guys have such, both of you, fabulous voices for that. I mean, it is, you know, I sort of was like, oh, I, I listened to those and thought, oh, I have to read this book, but I wonder if, if I can get Hank to read the rest of it for me too. You know, it's just so wonderful it's to get a, read to. Well, you know, it's a, it's a huge responsibility. We, Hannah and I practice and practice before the, sh before we read it live on the show, because, you know, that's your baby, Danielle. Yeah, I, I want to give, give it the, um, the power and the rhythm and the, you know, the acclaim for how well it's written. And so yeah. how well it's read really makes, really makes a difference. So thank you. We, we have fun. Well, that is really sweet. You know, um, um, 
Hannah read the beginning of my book, Exhum, which is a medical examiner. And there were some words in there because it was a, it had some autopsy stuff. And she was like, I cannot believe you put these words in this. You know, and of course, I never would, I never even imagined, I never thought about who would be, you know, the audio um, narrator or Hannah or anybody. So that was, she did it perfectly, but that was lovely. So I can see how you'd have to sort of prep for that. So um, well, anyway, thank you for continuing that. And thank you for stepping in there with Hannah, because those are a real treat. And it's another wonderful way for people to to um, discover new new authors, new voices, which is um, like so this, fun. Just like this is, just like this is. I mean, it's so amazing that the pandemic, which was such a disaster, um, has engendered these wonderful ways for people like you to keep together our community, keep, to keep us um, discovering new books and discovering new authors and keeping yeah. up with our favorite authors or making a new one. You know, it's, 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 this is, this has been a, a silver lining. A Absolutely. Definite. And here's to us. I do think, like you said about writer friends at the beginning of our conversation, those author, you know, communities. And, you know, I only do women because I had to sort of figure out a way to chop the, you know, there's so many incredible books and, and authors I had. I was like, I got, it's too many. I'm just going to focus on the ladies, um, which, you know, I only a few men grumble. They mostly understand. So, um, but it is, a you know, we, we have an incredible community and for aspiring authors, that's another thing to find is to find, you know, an online group or your local sisters in crime or mystery writers of America or romance writers of America. My first writers group was a romance writers group, but even though I never wrote romance, so it can kind of be anybody, I think, but that's, that I'm, we are very blessed for our incredible community. So I mean, it's interesting. My very first, when my first book was, when I was working on my first book, I went to a romance writers meeting and met Lisa Gardner. Yes, and, who's and amazing. We've been yeah. friends ever since. So you just don't know. You just yeah. don't know. Every single possibility can bring you um, unexpected joy. Absolutely. That's yeah. And that's, a, I mean, that is exactly. And people, I think authors are very generous. We, you know, we know what it's like to never have published a book. We've been there. So uh, I think it's in, they're incredibly lovely people. Um, and, you know, and speaking of incredibly lovely or not people, we have the house guests. So go get your copy of the house guests, Hank, uh, Philippi Ryan. Um, this is out February 7th. And this is your 14th book this is my 14th book I'm so excited about it I absolutely I can just tell you all I just love the house guest I'm really I'm proud of it um I'm excited by it I was surprised by it I can't wait for you to meet Alyssa and Brie and decide whose side you're on and which character is the cat and which I love it yes which is the cat and which is the mouse Yes. Well, me too. I can't wait. And if you, when you find out how much you love this, you've got a, a big fat backlist to get through as well. Hank, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so fun to chat. You, you're so brilliant. And it's great to hear um, about your stories and your, and your, your incredible career and all your well-earned hundred million awards. Million. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that calculation, Danielle, and use it. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here. It was so great. For everybody joining us, this was uh, Killer Women Podcast with Hank Phillippe Ryan, and we will see you next time. Bye.